Dr. Kathy Armour, a passionate educator, was, until recently, head of the newly formed School of Sport, Exercise, and Rehabilitation Sciences at Birmingham. The new school brought together academics from pedagogy, sport exercise sciences, and physical therapy. Then, this past August, she was appointed Pro Vice Chancellor, Chancellor for Education, which is analogous to being Provost for Academic Affairs here in the United States. As an international fellow in the NAK since 2013, Professor Armour is regarded globally as a leading expert on the study of career-long professional learning or continuing professional development for physical educators and sport coaches. Continuing professional development lies at the heart of ensuring that professionals remain current in their craft, and Kathy has been instrumental in shedding light on the barriers to and the needed conditions for successful professional continuing development. More recently, she has turned her attention to exploring the use of case studies as a pedagogical approach to developing stronger connection between research and practice in physical education. Of course, as you know, case studies are a frequently used tools, a tool in other professions, such as law and medicine. And this is the topic of her presentation today, titled Pedagogical Cases, a New Translational Mechanism to Bridge the research and practice gaps in youth physical activity education. So please join me in welcoming this year's C. Lynn Van Dien lecturer, Dr. Kathy Armour. Um, it's a great honor to be here today and to deliver this lecture um, in the name of Dr. Van Dien. Um, I'm very, de I'm delighted to be here. Okay, so what am I gonna cover today? Basically, this paper focuses on an old problem and the old problem is that we know we have long-standing, persistent theory, stroke research, practice gaps in our broad field. So I'm going to also explore with you one potential solution. I have to say this is really at proof of concept stage. So, you know, it is not a panacea, but I'm trying to work towards something. So I'll look at an analysis of the problem. Um, I'll give an overview and an illustration of the ways in which um, we've used these pedagogical cases. I'll say at the outset that a pedagogical case is really just a case study of a learner, looking at that learner from a number of different disciplinary perspectives. And I'll talk more in more detail as we go through. I'm using the term physical activity education here because you know, I'm, I'm really, as I go through my career, I'm becoming more aware of the gaps that hold us back in making progress in our field. And I use the term physical activity education because each individual goes through life wanting to learn or needing to learn about physical activity at different stages. But actually, our professions that try to help us to learn don't treat us as an individual. We're siloed up. So we get teachers, we get coaches, we get instructors, we get therapists, but actually they don't cooperate around their pedagogies. So the person who goes through, a life, through life as an individual is chunked up into the silos of the professions that deal with them. And I wonder whether that's the best way forward because we're the same person and we'd quite like our learning to build um, as we go through. Finally, I'm gonna have a little bit of a challenge for us as a profession. I'm going to ask us whether our field is mature. <coughs> Earlier writers have set this challenge to us, what we need for a mature field. So I'm going to ask whether we're actually there now. And if we look ahead, how do we view our field um, in, say, 10 years or 20 years? OK. <coughs> So first of all, I thought maybe I'd just show you uh, where I come from. I come from the University of Birmingham in the UK. We're in the middle, as you can see, slap bang in the middle. Um, we're a mixture of beautiful old and, from my perspective, even more beautiful new. Um, and like many you know, campuses, we have 35,000 students. So in, in US terms, that's not huge. So what's the problem? So my fundamental premise is that we have a large, persistent, multi-dimensional theory research practice gap that characterizes the field of youth physical activity education. And I think this is a huge barrier. We know that existing pedagogies and practices are not hugely effective 
in encouraging people to be active. The data tell us that. We know that there are researchers, many of them are in this room, that are producing great knowledge that could be really useful to practitioners. Okay. But how often do practitioners get the opportunity to engage with the kind of great knowledge that we're producing? What mechanisms exist for that to happen? And how do practitioners get to drive the research agendas? Because when you think about it, they're the ones that have to use what we're developing. And finally, you know, that, that silo we have between our professions is unhelpful. Now, I'm not going to say anything about this um, because all the problems around physical activity, physical inactivity, sedentary behaviors, you all know it, it's the wrong audience for it. But given that we know that we have this huge global challenge around physical activity, you might expect that as a matter of routine, all the key practitioners would be working together and they would be drawing on our cutting edge research. Why wouldn't they be? That's what we need. We would also assume that practitioners were routinely driving the research agenda and we would surely assume that kinesiology researchers would be collaborating across their disciplines to provide the kind of knowledge that we need, to make sure that research makes sense for practice. Because kinesiology, unless I'm wrong, is fundamentally an applied field which applies, is applied to a specific set of practices. Yet, none of those things happens. None of those things happens. Now, I wonder whether that may have something to do with the fact, uh, with, the, with the finding that most, we don't get as much physical activity as we know we need to do. There's no point in anyone blaming anyone else for this. It's a multi-layered multi problem, and you know, we, we can end up being defensive very quickly. But nobody is doing anything wrong intentionally. Of course, everyone's trying to do their best for the field. If we go back to universities, I don't know what it's like in your university, but I know how we reward our academics. And we do not reward our academics very well for getting out there and doing work with practitioners. We do reward them a bit, but we reserve our highest medals for the people who get the biggest grants and publish in the papers that, uh, in the journals that no practitioner will ever read. That's who we reward the most and the fastest. So universities are not really helping very much. And more's the point, when those papers are published, think about the number of places they're published. How many journals would a practitioner have to subscribe to? I'm talking about, a, let's say, a physical education teacher. How many journals would they have to subscribe to across how many disciplines to get access to all the knowledge that's being produced that apparently is about helping them to do their job better. I have to say the pedagogy field is absolutely no exception to this, so I'm not, I'm not making a claim for my own field. We also publish research in journals, mainly, that no practitioner will ever have the time to read. Actually, they don't, just don't get access to them. And you know, we have to understand that First of all, trying to bring our knowledge together, it's widely recognized, is just difficult. Now, this morning, there were one or two occasions when people from different disciplines started to ding-dong with each other. I loved that. That was great. I felt then we might be moving to something where we were going to learn something different because you're at the forefront of your fields, and the bits where you clash are probably where the new knowledge is to be found. So, given that practitioners rarely engage with research in the ways that they find helpful, it's really not surprising to find that they, find they tend to view research as being irrelevant for their needs on the whole. And actually, we end up with frustration on both sides. Researchers are frustrated because practitioners are using old practice, and practitioners are frustrated because they don't even know what they're supposed to be doing or which bits of contradictory evidence they should actually be listening to. 
That's a daily problem for them if they even know about the research. There's another big issue here, and this is probably the, this was a, a kind of a dawning moment for me, and I'm sorry if it took me a long time to get there and you got it years ago. And that is that practice, physical activity practice, physical education, youth sport coaching, wherever a practitioner is helping a group of young people to learn, practice is always interdisciplinary. Every bit of practice is interdisciplinary. Think about that for a minute. On the other hand, nearly all the research we produce is disciplinary or subdisciplinary. So that's a really big gap for us to, to fill. When you talk, what is interdisciplinary? I like this, I like this, uh, this description, Repco uses this. He's, and I think what he's talking about here is what I would term interdisciplinary studies in action. It's a process of answering a question, solving a problem, or addressing a topic that's too broad or complex to be dealt with adequately by a single discipline, and draws on the discipline to disciplines with the goal of integrating their insights to construct a more comprehensive understanding. That sounds to me very much like teaching a class of kids in phys ed. That's what you have to do all the time. So, again, I'm not saying anything new here. Um, Bruce Abernathy has been saying this forever. He said it in 96, he said it again in 2013, and there are others as well, of course. And he said the field of human movement studies is probably most accurately described as multidisciplinary, whereas the desirable direction is to make it more cross-disciplinary um, and ultimately interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary. And he said the aspiration is to cross arbitrary boundaries by synthesizing material from the subdisciplines. And Abernathy and colleagues argued this was most likely to happen when our field matured when our field matured. So I suppose the question is, I mean, he was saying it in 96, and people said it before him, and he said it, he repeated it in 2013. How long do, are we going to wait for our field to mature if we think that's, that's something it needs to do? Hochstetler argued that perhaps the most essential aspect of teaching and learning is developing connections or relations between themes and subject matters of various sorts. Tinning recently pointed out that a mature field of study is more than a collection of sophisticated theories and robust and rigorous empirical work. And he referred to Kretschmar's much earlier work, which said researchers tend to work in silos of knowledge that reinforce a form of tribal type, tribal type identification. Do you remember saying that, Scott? Yeah. Um, so, and he said this presents general problems related to fractionation, poor communication, and lack of mutual respect. And you know, there's, some of those comments are still relevant. So now think about a PE teacher teaching a class of children of any age. Just think about the practice. In teaching PE, the sheer breadth of research that could be pertinent to a single learning encounter is really quite breathtaking. It's impractical, therefore, to expect teachers to understand and connect all these different sources of knowledge that in themselves are dynamic. But in fact, as researchers, we make rather few attempts to do this difficult work. We expect practitioners to do it every day in their practice, but we don't make that many efforts to do it ourselves. Sometimes we're really brave and we combine two disciplines. Now, again, think of the class teacher. Um, Evans and Davis have argued that even in the context of training researchers in our fields and subfields, we adopt kind of isolationist practices. Again, not necessarily because we, we really are trying to, but because the scale of the task in each of the subdisciplines appears so great all by itself that we don't have the time to do anything more. Is the problem unique to kinesiology? No, of course it isn't. Um, and I'm going to use the example of the wider body of education research here, um, because this is, a, you know, this, is, this is obviously not unique to kinesiology. So there have been numerous attempts to bridge the theory research practice gap. There is so much research in education 
There, is, there has been research long before we started in our field, and it's all over the world, masses of it. And you know, you can look back, you can look to the 90s and you can see Schoen's work, Schulman's work, different types of practitioner research to try and bridge the gap between uh, research and practice. Dewey in 1958 looked at new ways, um, looked at the importance of experience and continu continuity in learning. Clandinen and Connolly looked at um, teachers as researchers, and Stenhouse, of course, in the 70s. All that work, which was all about bridging the gap in education. And yet, in 2014, Pollard said, um, I've reflected on a decade of educational research, and I'm clear that the future must be around innovation, interdisciplinary collaboration, systematic accumulation of international knowledge. And he said the most effective educators in the future will be able to synthesize knowledge from across disciplines. And Anitha Ball said, she challenged researchers and said, to know is not enough as a researcher. She said, we're very good at doing research that shows we know a lot of stuff. But it's not enough if we're claiming that our research is serving a practice community. And um, Anitha Ball said, we have a lack of resources and mechanisms to promote the use of research to improve education. And she said research should move away from, uh, towards the idea that we want to close the knowing, doing gap. And she didn't say that was easy, but she said we need to really think about that. More recently, here in the United States, Penuel and Farrell talked about your ESSA Act and said we need to be aiming for research practice partnerships. Um, and you know, partnerships are a two-way endeavor in which practice informs the questions researchers ask, making research more relevant. And the claim they were making is that unless we develop these, unless you here develop these research practice partnerships, then the ESSA Act will not, uh, ESSA, sorry, will not um, meet its challenges. So who's responsible then? Um, this is an interesting one. If we come back to um, the recent, I've got, I've got to mention the referendum, the Brexit referendum in the UK. I cannot get through this whole presentation without. And it's kind of interesting because when they look at the social sciences and the role of the social sciences in the run-up to the EU referendum, there's now a really broad, as you will know, experts in the UK have become um, excommunicated, really. Nobody wants to listen to an expert. But interestingly, um, Walker says that it could have been very different if the social sciences, instead of battling each other and coming out with fragmented bits of information which no one could pull together, if they'd all worked together to present some information to the British public which might have had a little bit more coherence for them. Anyway, it didn't happen, did it? So, all right, professional development. If, whose responsibility is it to start doing this bridging work? Nobody was doing it for, in, in the EU referendum. Everyone was firing off in their own direction. So in our field, who's responsible for doing the bridging work? And sometimes people say to me, it's continuing professional developers who need to do the bridging work. That's their job. So if, if, for example, we train teachers and then we send them out into the profession, it's the continuing professional development that will do the job of bridging the research and practice. Okay, well, there's a quote about what effective CPD needs in order to be effective. It needs a principal focus on collective endeavor in which participants at all levels of the system work towards mutually agreed outcomes and hold a shared theory of improvement. Let me tell you, there is no evidence anywhere to show that that ever happens. Okay, continuing professional development is not the answer in the broad education field, and it's not the answer in physical education either. We just did a, a paper and we concluded that much existing CP, uh, PECPD is exactly as teachers have been telling us for years. It doesn't meet their needs. And we argued for a complete refocus, which said things like we need to recognize the dazzling complexity of the learning process. Do you know, there are people who think teaching PE is easy. 
They think it's easy. And I think that's held the field back massively. Teaching PE to a large group of 12-year-old children is one of the most difficult tasks you're ever going to come across. We need to recognize that because it's been trivialized because we haven't recognized how difficult it is. We need to recognize the dazzling complexity of the learning process, understand context and contemporary challenges, seek to bridge, here I am again, research theory practice in innovative ways, and focus on nurturing the career-long growth of our PE teachers. Because, folk, it's the PE teachers who are with the children around the world. They, you know, that's one place, that's one learning opportunity. I'm not saying it will make everyone active and solve all the problems, but heck, it is one lifetime learning opportunity that's really rather valuable. So, I don't know whether we can keep leaving, the, the, um, leaving this work to other people. I wonder whether we shouldn't be taking a leading role in bridging these gaps. So we made, I made a start. Um, now, this is very much a start. And to date, we've got 33 pedagogical cases in these two books. Okay? And what is a pedagogical case? Let's just go there first. It's a case study of an individual learner or a group of learners. I've got teams of academics from four disciplines or subdisciplines who've come together to work on the case. In the first book, um, on this, the phys, uh, Pedagogical Cases in Physical Education and Youth Sport, the case, at the heart of the case, is one single child. So the teams came together from their different disciplines, and they constructed a narrative of a single child. Age, gender, you name it, background, religion, whatever it was they felt was important. And they then, um, all, all they had to do in the first book was to work together across their academic subdisciplines to reflect on the ways in which their knowledge, their cutting edge knowledge, could, shed, could give us an understanding of that young one single learner. And in the second book, we went a step further and tried to bridge across to practitioners, and a practitioner wrote the narrative based on the ways in which they are trying to use digital technologies in physical education. So they wrote the narrative. And then the team came together and again reflected on uh, what it was that was in the case. Each case has the same framework. And I thought this was important to try and bring them together. So the case narrative comes first. And then there are observations by the three subdiscipline experts. And then there is an attempt at a synthesis by the pedagogy expert. And in the second book, the practitioner also reflects at the end of the process. Now, how do you get people who are not at all interested in pedagogy to contribute to something as lowly as a book chapter, which is not even in their field? And I'll tell you the way you do it. Uh, you say all you have to do is write a 1,000 words on your favorite topic. That's what I asked them to do. Had I asked them to turn, do any more than that, I don't think they would have done it. Because on their CV, this is not going to look great. But I just said, just ask them to write a 1,000 words. They, they read the narrative, or they may even help to construct the narrative. Why didn't I use real children in the first book? Ethically, I just thought it was too difficult. That's why I constructed narratives in the first book of the children. But all you need to do is you don't have to apply your knowledge. The pedagogy person will do that. You just need to write a 1,000 words on your favorite topic. And it was very interesting. Some of the teams just stayed apart, wrote their bit, put it together. Some of the teams actually came together, wrote the narrative together, did the analysis together, and learned new things about each other as a result. And they found it was a completely new way of working for them. And they enjoyed doing it. They didn't all enjoy doing it, but some of them actually did. So at their best, the pedagogical cases do bring together knowledge. I'm, I have to say, this is not the way you would choose to do them. Why did I do them in a book? Because it was the cheapest way to do them at this point in time. But you wouldn't really want to do them in a book, would you? You'd want to have them as digital. That would be the ideal. Why case studies? 
because, um, if we come back, because case studies are something that teachers can relate to. It brings the knowledge around a real person. And case studies are multidimensional, so it starts to, to recognize practice um, in a better way. Um, why narrative? Because teachers also love narrative, and if you get to the, go to the continuing professional development research, what do they love to do? Share stories with each other, that, that whole respectable historic tradition of storytelling. And one other thing really sparked this, and that was I, I was observing, I have friends in, in, who are cardiologists, and I was observing a massive cardiology conference. And I saw the best professional development opportunity I have ever seen, and I've never seen it in education. And that is, you had about, I don't know, thousands of people in the, in the room, loads more people online, and they did cases. Systematically, they did cases where you know, you didn't actually need to see the person. You saw the angiogram, and they could talk through. And do you know what? In that room, what was really impressive, they could all refer to, they were asked to, as the case went on, the case would be stopped. They were asked to refer to the evidence that would lead them to take the next decision in the case. And then they could debate whether they thought the evidence was relevant. Why don't we use case studies in, edu in physical education and youth sport coaching in this way? Because we could build up the most incredible international repository of cases where we could then chuck in our disciplinary knowledge and fight with each other. And that's what we really need to be doing, fighting with each other, because that's where we're going to get some really interesting new knowledge. OK, so just a couple of examples then of the cases. And you know, as I've said before, these are modest, proof of concept, starting points. Every single person involved in these cases had to learn to do something in a new way, and we weren't always very good at it. But just to give you an example, Sophie was a, um, a five-year-old girl. This was a team from Belgium. You can see them there. Five-year-old girl who attends preschool. Her teachers noticed she was showing early signs of motor delay. She had difficulty with fundamental movement skills, and she was fearful of engaging in physical activity. So the experts came together, um, and they, they focused on the misconceptions about the development of motor skills. And they concluded, when they looked at the case in the round, that young learners are heavily reliant on a whole range of informed adults and the opportunities they provide. And they note the damage that can be done when adults, and that's all the adults in the mix, um, fail to, uh, don't understand um, the consequences of getting it wrong. I can't go into any detail, obviously, with these, um, but there will be more detail in the paper. Um, Rob, a, a good team from Canada, present, pr uh, put together a case. Rob is an 11-year-old early maturing Canadian boy who was recently selected for an elite ice hockey team. Um, he has a strong background in sport. His parents are very supportive, and so on. And he becomes rather good. Um, but as he's asked to train seriously, he begins to lose interest. So the experts came together. And they produced um, an a set of evidence-based guidelines for supporting people, uh, young people like Rob, which included things like knowing that his parents needed to be informed about Rob's social needs, because they were very aware of his sporting needs, but not necessarily his social needs. And finally, in the second book, where the practitioner wrote the narrative about the ways they were trying to use Digitech to, make their, you know, to help their children to learn, um, and Gareth wrote, the nar wrote this narrative. And he described himself as being more interested in learning than teaching. And for him, the iPad and the apps to which it gave access are effective for engaging a range of students. Um, and Gareth's narrative was considered from four perspectives. Um, and as, as he looked, what was really interesting there was the neurophysiologist and the motor learning completely disagreed as to the use of ideal models with the iPad. Um, in, in coaching particular activities. So that, that was really interesting. But the teacher concluded, um, I think that the value and impact of iPads on learning and its potential, it's too difficult to assess from my perspective alone. I need to work with these researchers more to understand how to improve my practice. So I concluded that you can get groups of people to work together from different disciplines if you make the task realistic and remember that they've got other priorities. Co-construction by teams is, is challenging and rewarding but insightful. Narratives are good message. 
uh, mechanism, and the pedagogy th synthesis work was really difficult. We don't, we don't have the tools to do some of that. And on top of that, after everything I said about interdisciplinary, we hardly got there. We, still, we were still stuck in our multidisciplinary thinking because it's probably what we've all always done. So to conclude, I think that the challenge, if we're going to develop this model any further, is to look at much better ways of uh, presenting the model, definitely digital cases which are freely available across the professions so that we as researchers can chip into them and use them to inform. It's a, it's a tool that we can use to inform. Um, I would really like to see, I mean, the Football Association wants us to do some, you know, English soccer is in great difficulty, you understand, so they'll take anything they can get. Um, but the Football Association would like us to do some cases with them of young children trying to learn in football. Um, we've looked at things like aging cases, aging uh, older exercises. There are many things we could do to use this as a tool to bring together the knowledge that we have. Um, and I think if we were to do it well, um, however, we'd need quite a lot of funding and we would also um, need leadership from some of the most respected uh, kinesiologists in our field. So I'm not looking at anyone in particular. <laughs> so the question is, has our field reached that level of maturity? If we're not going to do this work, who is? And when Pamela Hyde talked the other night about needing to see kinesiologists in some of these calls, well, wouldn't it be nice if she was calling on a kinesiologist because she knew they would bring together the interdisciplinary knowledge that we need from the multidisciplinary teams that we need in order to really add something different to the single discipline people who actually lurk outside of our field. There's plenty of them in nutrition, there's plenty of them in neuroscience, there's plenty of them in psychology, and actually, you know, they're in on our territory, and they don't mind doing it. But we could offer something different, and I wonder if we will. And that is that. Thank you.